I ask you to turn over to Galatians, the fifth chapter, in verse 17. And the reason I ask you to do this, and as you can kind of guess by looking at the screen right now, it's really talking about decisions. But this morning, we're going to be looking at this thought of desiring to do good. But with this thought of desiring to do good, we're actually going to put our focus around what we just filled out. We're going to put our focus around helping out here, doing things here. That's where we're going to have our focus because we want, or I want to make sure that we know what the scripture says about it. I think Tad did a wonderful job in letting us know that it tells us it's very clear that we need to be willing to help. But we're going to look at more about that in a moment. Before we do, first I want to look over in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse 17, where it tells us, where it tells us this, it says, that's not working right. Where it tells us this, for the flesh, for the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that they do not do the things that you wish. This verse is actually telling us that we have two decisions to make in life. You can make the decision to do those things which lust against the spirit. Or you can do those things which are for the spirit. One is contrary to the other, and the other is contrary to the other. Does that make sense? So what we have to understand is that we have to make a choice on what are we going to do. And as we look and as we see things going on to today's world and today's society, what we really see is that this is winning out more often. This is winning out so often today that we see things, we see things that are sinful. And we see them going on all the time, and yet the world now looks at it as something to be proud of. Things like fornication. Proud of what they are doing and their sin. We see these things going on. But as Mike mentioned last week, we're not going to go into a whole complete another lesson of this verse. But as we look over in 1 John, the second chapter, verse 16, where it tells us, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life is not the Father, is not of the Father, but is of the world. We have to understand and we have to remember something when we're talking about this. We have to understand that this is not of God. That decision, if we were to make it, would not come from God. And we have to understand that this is a decision that we make to go ahead and fulfill the desires of this world, to fulfill the lusts of this world. We have to understand that it's going to pass. These lusts will pass away. 1 John 2 chapter verse 17. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of the God abides forever. This is the things that we need to remember. And we need to remember as we turn back over to Galatians, the fifth chapter. Turn back over to Galatians, the fifth chapter. We have to remember this. That if we choose to do these things, that it only leads to one place. Choosing to do these things of the world. Rule and lead to one place, and that one place is not the kingdom of God, as we're told in verse 21 of Galatians 5. Envy, murder, drunkenness, rivalries, and light, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It is not possible. And we understand that when we look up and we see further, because they are what? Contrary to the Spirit. We have to remember this. But we also have another option in our life. In the reality of it, we have a better option in our life. We have a good option in our life. One that doesn't lead to something that's going to pass away. But one that leads to eternal life. And as I said, we're going to look at that more this evening, what eternal life is. But in desiring to do that which God desires. You see, when we talk about what we need to desire to do, we need to understand that it needs to not be what does Jason desire to do. We need to have the mindset of what does God desire for me to do. That's where we need to be thinking. That's where we need to be putting our focus. Hebrews 11, chapter and verse 6. Here we find a desire from God where it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. First of all, we have to understand that God desires us to have faith. Something so easy to say. It's something that sometimes do we overlook this? Something so easy that 
do I really think God desires for me to have faith? Easy statement. But as we continue on in that verse, it says, For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God desires so much so for us to have faith, so much so for us to believe in him, so much so for us to come to him and draw near to him, not just that he's saying, okay, come to me, and that's the end. No, he says, come to me, and guess what? I'm going to reward you for coming to me. God wants to reward us. He wants to give us something. He wants to give us this chance to be able to be with him in glory. We're going to look at that this evening as well. But as we look and as we continue in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verses 1 through 4, he desires that we are to be saved. Why? Because without that, the hope, that glory isn't possible. 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 1 through 4, where it says, Therefore I exhort first of all the supplications, prayers, intersections, and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all goodness and reverence. For this is a good and acceptable in the sight of our God, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for, for all, to be testified in due time, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. God desires that we are to be saved. Why? Because he wants to reward us. And God just hasn't done this and said, okay, I desire for you to be saved, now figure it out. That's not what's been done. You know, I'll be the first one to admit that I do not like online classes. I don't like it because I don't feel like I'm actually being taught anything. I don't feel like the teachers are actually teaching me anything. Because, but when it comes to being a Christian, that's not how it is. It's not a matter of, okay, I want you to be saved. Now figure out how to be saved on your own. No. Over in John, the 14th chapter, verse 1 through 6, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and where I go now, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Thomas proposes this thought of, how do we figure this out? What does Jesus tell him there in verse 6? says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We've been given a test. We've been given this test, and guess what? We've been given the book, and we say, okay, open book test. There's never a reason to not get 100% on that, is it? Open up our word. Open up the word of life, and let it guide us. Let it show us how do we get to Christ. You know what I said? We're going to put our focus around the choices that we're going to be making on this list this morning. The choices that we're going to be making on what are we willing to do. And right now I want to ask a question that if it were asked to me, I know that there's a lot of things I need to do more. I want to ask this question. What are our choices thus far? In the life that we have now, what are the choices that we have made up to this point? Have we made the choices as Tad brought up to be here on Wednesday night? Have we made the choices to come back on Sunday night? Have we made the choices to do it and to learn everything we can about the Word of God, everything we can about one another? Over in Matthew, the 7th chapter, verses 15 through 20, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. I'm going to stop there for just a moment. You know, when we think about trying to figure out what our choices are thus far and what type of person that has made me up to this point, sometimes we think, I, I don't really even know that. The only person who knows that is God because he has to judge our hearts. Well, you know what? Matthew teaches us that we know men by their fruits. We know because their fruits is a direct representation of their hearts. So I'm going to take some time, not right now necessarily. Let's take some time this week and let's think, what are my fruits showing me? 
As we continue on, it says, Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit, you will know them. Well, let's ask this question. Up to this point in our life, when it comes to the choices that we have made, the fruits that we are going to take some time this week and look at our fruits and say, what have my fruits shown? Am I a good tree or am I a bad tree? Am I a tree that is bearing this good fruit and bearing all these things or am I going to be one that is cut down and thrown into the fire? Don't go into this with yourself thinking on a biased level. Don't go into this thinking, I go to church on Sunday morning. Go into this and actually look at the decisions we make and the fruits that come from them. And see, what does this tell me about myself? What has this shown me about myself? Because you know what? When we actually look at this, sometimes we find that we're excusing ourselves from things. We're excusing ourselves from certain responsibilities in our life. And that's what we're going to look at. That's why we're going to look at it with reference to this list that we've been given this morning. Because we need to say, are we, are we excusing ourselves from the local responsibilities here? The responsibilities that are needed here in order to help this congregation grow. Responsibilities like leading prayer, song leading, teaching. Um, this is not an extensive list, promise. But are we excusing ourselves from things like these? You know, Moses tried to excuse himself, didn't he, over in Exodus, the third chapter, verse 11. Over in Exodus, the third chapter, verse 11, where it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said to God, Who am I? Do we use this same thing? When it comes to, let's say, teaching a class, who am I that I should be the one in there teaching these children? What authority do I have in order to teach these children? Guess what? I'll be the first to admit. I have none. Anybody disagree with that statement? We don't have authority. What we have is to follow the authority which Christ has given, which Christ has shown us this is what we need to do. What do we need to be doing? Teaching our children about the scripture. Or how about with this? Do we think, you know what? As Moses or as God explains to Moses who he is, right? He tells him, no, you tell him that the I am, the I am sent you. When we look at this, do we think, will they even listen to me? Our job is to present the message. Our job is to teach. Our job is to recognize these things as we see over Matthew 28, chapter verse 18, as we've already mentioned. All authority comes from Christ. Or how about this? Moses' excuse in chapter 4, verse 10. Moses' excuse here when he says, Then Moses said to, my, said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who is the man who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. Do we think, you know what? I don't think I'm a good choice for this. And I think that's you know, I don't I don't think I'll be able to teach the children. I don't think I'll be able to teach the adults very well. Have we thought these things? Yeah, I know I have. I probably shouldn't be teaching. I'm not, I'm not always, when I was younger, I'm not always that great with little kids. I love them little kids now so much. And you know what? I guarantee you that there's not a teacher here that doesn't say that they love to see the innocence and the answers of those children. They love to see and see them growing and learning and being able to tell you and respond to these answers. You know, well, we're not going to learn that unless we're in there with them. You're not going to get to figure that out unless you're a teacher in there with them seeing these things. So do we want to? Do we desire this good thing? 
to be able to ask these children questions. It does that. To ask these children questions and to see the responses they get. I'll tell you right now, when we sing, God is so good. I absolutely love hearing Colton. I absolutely love it because when you hear him sing, you hear innocence. And you hear that he actually means what he is saying. This is what we need to be able to have. This comes when we're in that room with these children, being able to learn from them. Yeah, I said learn from them, because we were. But I also want to make this very clear for those who, who are the adults and thinking, you know what? I don't think adults are going to be able to learn from me. I thought that once. Actually, I remember going through classes, and I remember telling my mom before, Mom, I'm just not getting anything out of class. I think it's the teacher's fault. You know what my mom told me? She said, Jason, you get out of class what you put into class. She's right. Absolutely right. If I don't put anything into my studies, I don't put anything into trying to learn, trying to be a participating member of class, I'm not going to get anything out of it. If we put something into it, we're going to get things out of it. You see, helping out and doing these things and excusing ourselves from things, it's not just excusing ourselves from being a teacher or from leading a prayer. It's excusing ourselves from things like preparing for class and being ready when we walk through those doors to have a discussion. Because that's what class is. Class is not a lecture. It's a discussion because we want to help each other. See, no matter what excuse we're using, there's always a better, there's always a better reason to become more involved. It doesn't matter what excuse we try and use. It doesn't matter. There's always a reason better to say, I want to do something more. Or if we're using the scripture to teach, see, this is one of those answers to, well, are they really going to be able to learn from me? If we're using the scripture to teach what it says, then we're not going to have anything to worry about as far as that goes. I said it this morning in class. I'll say it again. Romans 1 verse 16. For the power of salvation comes from God. The power of salvation is in the Word of God. It's not in Jason White. It's not in Mike. It's not in any of our teachers and Tad. It's, it's not there. It's in the Word of God. So if that's what we're teaching, then we have nothing to worry about. But you know what? When we're excusing ourselves, what we really find happening is that we're fleeing. We're running away from the responsibilities that we actually have, from the things that we actually need to be doing. Jonah did this over in Jonah, the first chapter, verse 3. We find that Jonah fled to where? Tarshish. He fled away. Why? Because we see over in verse, chapter 4, verse 2, it says that he fled because he was afraid that God would not punish Nineveh. He had no reason to not go. He had no reason to flee from his responsibilities. But yet he did. Tad's already read over in Romans, the 12th chapter, where we're going to read it again. Romans 12, we're going to look at verses 4 through 8. You see, when we talk about fleeing from the responsibilities we have, let's think about it with regards to our body. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 through 8 says, For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do, do not have the same function." So we being many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. In prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Why are we to do these things? Because as you continue on, or as we're fixing a look over in 1 Corinthians, what we find is that each member has its own job. But you know what? Sometimes we might look and we might think, that's, that's not my responsibility. Have we tried to embrace that responsibility? Have we tried to embrace these different things? Ted mentioned it. He did it very well this morning already. Have we done these things already? Have we tried to learn the last names of the members here? Have we tried to send out cards to the visitors here and say, hey, we want you to come back or we loved having you here? Have we done these things? Has, 
How do we know if that's our strength if we don't try it? How do we know if that's something we're going to be good at if we don't try to do it? We need to be trying to do these things, not just immediately writing them off. But as we get back to this thought that I had rabbit holed down early, over in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, verses 14 through 16. First Corinthians 12, verses 14 through 16, it says, For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would they be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the hand, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our presentable parts have their greater have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to the part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honor, all the members rejoice. We don't always add that last part on to this. But if one member suffers, all the members suffer. If I lose my foot, all the members suffer because of it. If I'm not able to get and move around, it's not just my foot that's suffering. If we aren't willing to step in and to try and do things and to try and help out, we're not just making it where one member is suffering. We're doing it to everybody. Why do we make sure that we are a body, whole, because it says later on in that verse, we want to rejoice. Let's ask this question this morning. Are we fleeing from our responsibilities? Are we fleeing from the responsibilities that we've been given? Are we causing suffering here? See, we don't always want to hear these types of questions, but we need to. We need to hear these things. But this is what happens when we're giving it to them. When we're giving in to these excuses in our life, what we find is that we're letting our heart, this thing that was told in Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, verse 9, what we find is that we're giving in to this, this thing that is deceitful above all things. Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In verse 10 it says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind. Even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. That's not saying that the heart can't have good, because if we put good into the heart, good will come from it. But if we put excuses in, excuses are going to come. Make sure that we're not putting in these things. Make sure that our earthly desires aren't winning over the spirit. Aren't winning over the desires of God. Make sure we're not becoming that of an evil doer. I asked Brittany about this before because you know what? This is something that when I read it, I thought, do I really want to say it? The answer is yes. Why? Because it's found in the Word of God. In the 37th Psalm, verse 1 and 2, it says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. And it continues on in what we are to do in God. You know what? If that's not what we're doing, what have we become? An evil doer. That's why I didn't want to say, I don't know how many people are going to listen after I say, are you an evil doer? That's a question we don't want to hear. I don't want somebody to ask that of me. That's something we need to ask of ourselves. But if we're letting these earthly desires win over the things which we should be doing, that's indeed what we've become. That's indeed what we are doing. As we draw our lesson to a close, I want to look at just a, a couple more things that maybe we can take with us as we leave this place this morning. 
First is this what first is this. We are humans. We have fears, we have excuses, and we always are gonna have these and say, Why aren't we good enough? My question is this in first Peter the fifth chapter and verse seven it says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. I might have fears, but you know what? I can cast those on, on God. I might have all these things, but I can cast them somewhere else. Have I? Have I cast these excuses away? And the other is this. Are we ready to stop letting our excuses and fears decide what we're going to do? 1 Corinthians 12, chapter verse 26, it says, If one member is honored, then all the members rejoice. We ask, are, you made, are we causing suffering here? Well, let's ask this better one. Do you want to have some rejoicing here? Because we have rejoicing with each and every member we have. So let's have rejoicing here. 